Hello, this is a review of the Intel i7-2600K processor. Now I'm really happy with the processor. It seems to fly for me and the i7 is a quad-core processor. The 2600K says a few things. Number one is the Dash 2 means it's the second generation whereas probably in the third generation you'll see Dash 3 on the chip numbers. And the K at the end, compared to the predecessors in the second generation that didn't have a K, it offers two benefits in the second gen series. Number one, which is what I was most interested in, is the K versions of these processors come with HD Graphics 3000. HD Graphics 3000 is significantly better than HD Graphics 2000 if you're going to be using onboard video rather than your own discrete graphics card. So. Um, HD Graphics 3000 is supposed to be very comparable to standard entry-level um, discrete graphics cards or, or better than. But the other benefit for me is it's built onto the chip. It also builds on video, especially HD video optimizations um, and video conversion optimizations. So having an HD video camera, I really wanted a processor that could handle HD video with some onboard optimization being built on with the graphics processor within the CPU itself. I believe that closeness is going to offer an optimization that's going to be hard to match elsewhere. So I can able to record and play back my HD video with my camcorder and convert to different formats with fairly good ease. The conversion is fairly fast. I mean, it's not instantaneous, but it is by far not painstaking. So I've heard some people say conversions take a really long time. So when I go to convert a video, it warns me, it says, warning, this will take a long time. And then it just cranks through and 30 seconds later, I have my video. So I was really happy with the HD graphics for that. And you can get a lower profile to your whole system, which offers a few benefits without a discrete graphics card. Number one is you don't have to have power that to power the graphics card, and graphics cards are often very power hungry. So if you want a lower energy bill for using your computer to pay bills and process playback video or watch TV shows on your computer, or stuff like that, I mean, you don't need a discrete graphics card for that. You can save on electricity by doing that. My computer idles at 50 watts um, on mine and seems to peak around 90 watts. And secondly, without a graphics card, which also generates a lot of heat, you're going to have a lower heat profile within your computer. And being a cooler computer, you can go with things like air cooling, like I have on this, and I don't even come close to reaching the higher end of um, heat thresholds. In the desktop monitoring software coming from the Intel motherboard, um, it tells me that I'm always at the very low end of the heat spectrum on the monitor, um, so that you know when you get higher heat, heat slows down computers too. Right? Heat is, you know, cool, computers run faster when cooler. So I. Uh, without the heat being generated by an extra high-end video card, uh, you're going to save on heat generation, you're going to have an easier job cooling your computer, and when there's less heat to cool, your fans don't have to run as hard and as fast. Um, all of the fans won't have to be running as fast, so you should have a quieter computer as well. So there's a lot of benefits to that of the K. Now the other thing the K gives you, the second thing, is it's an unlocked chip. So if you want to do overclocking and you match it to a motherboard like the Intel DZ68BC that offers overclocking capabilities, um, the chip will let you set it to higher thresholds and test different configurations so that you can try to run it higher than the um, stock specs of the CPU. So normally Intel will lock down the processor to disallow you from overriding their settings and running it at a faster speed than they intended it to. Now the K means that they, they will allow you to run it at anything you want at your own risk. So if you want to overclock your CPU, they will let you do that. You just take the responsibility if you burn up your chip, don't have adequate cooling, and also and, you know, and whether things become unreliable. Because basically, you know, if it runs faster than it expects, perhaps due to other variations in the chip, there may be you know, at some point it becomes unreliable, like maybe it misfires writing a command because it's running too fast for its own good. So um, you'll have other aspects like that. So they let you tune with it and find out what works for you before the system starts to have faults. Now, honestly, I don't want to overclock my CPU, right? So Intel has already decided which speeds work best on the vid on the processor that they generated what they think is the maximum it can be reliable at and 
offer other benefits like what's the heat profile that I have to worry about cooling and so as you start to overclock you know there are the specs on the chip probably aren't designed for basic fans and that's why you start need to look at liquid cooling and so on in those cases. We can see the stock CPU fan that comes with the Intel processor chip. Um, it works perfectly for the stock speeds of the chip if you're just using it not overclocked like me, otherwise you probably got to look at a much more serious solution to solve extra heat problems from running it above the clock speed. Um, a few things to note. So basically there's four holes in your motherboard. Here, here, wherever these end connections are. So there's another there and another there. Now basically all you're supposed to do is when these things, these arrows need to be rotated out this way by default at first. So not with the arrow against the edge there. And then you should be able to just put, set this gently into the right spot and then just push, 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 and they'll click, 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 click into place. But it wasn't that easy for me. They didn't actually all just pop into place like they would lead you to believe. So they tell you, you don't need to ratchet these down. They say, don't turn these with a screwdriver to ratchet into place. They say, you just turn this to open it up when you want to remove it. But personally, a few of my holes went in pretty easily, but I had to get a screwdriver and turn it. And once I turned it just a little bit, it seemed to settle itself and turn right into place. So just be aware, you might have to defy the instructions ever so slightly on that uh, to see if that helps work it into the hole. Uh, maybe the motherboard hole was a little tight. I, I don't know. I mean, it's an Intel motherboard with an Intel chip with an Intel processor, or I mean, an Intel fan. The other thing to mention is this power cable. You see this power cable? Basically, it runs around and then connects into the CPU fan port on your motherboard. But it comes wrapped around the device. So do you see this little hook there? And then there's another hook there facing up. So this one's facing down. That one's facing up. So basically, it comes wrapped down, over, down, and up. And I thought, gee, it's nice. It's cable management. I could just plug it in to my CPU fan port right there. But you can't use it like that and be really careful because the instructions aren't clear. They don't tell you to unravel it. So I think it just comes that way for packaging purposes. But the problem is, is it cuts the corner just slightly. It actually was in contact with the blades in a few different points, maybe one or two points. And the problem is, is you cannot obstruct this fan from spinning. So it was going to either be noisier or hurt the fan, let it not run at the speed that it needs to, or, you know, have all sorts of implications from noise to heat to the CPU failing early um, if the fan can't run it at speed. So definitely check that, unravel the cable, run it nice and out of the way so that the cable doesn't get in the way. So this is the stock fan that comes with the actual Intel chip itself when you buy the Realtail copy of the chip. Now this is the fan that Intel believes is all that you need to run this chip. And if you're not overclocking, it really is. You can just use this fan. Um, if you are overclocking, you have to deal with extra heat that you're generating by running it above spec and probably have to look at a liquid cooling system or something more powerful. But Intel believes, and will guarantee their chips with the stock fan that they provide, they believe it won't burn it up. Intel believes in it, otherwise they wouldn't give it to you, um, and they wouldn't guarantee their chips if uh, they gave you a fan that would burn up their chips. You need to apply thermal paste. Now, if you buy the retail version of the i7-2600K like I did, which comes with the fan, it comes with the thermal paste already applied in some neat looking strips. Um, don't touch it. Do not touch the top of that chip for anything with your fingers or an oil or anything. You don't want to mess up that thermal paste. Just let it be. Um, but if you need more, you should be able to go to uh, most electronic stores that sell computer parts and get thermal paste. Um, and then you're supposed to use just a dab. Uh, but it comes pre-applied, which is really nice. Um, so I liked that. And then you just put the fan on top of that and trust that it's going to spread that thermal paste out. Let's compare the 2600K with the 2700K. Basically, the 2700K only buys you 100 megahertz more over the 2600K. Uh, that's the only other benefit it gives you. So what I would recommend is look at the cost difference and just simply run the math. How much are you paying for that extra 100 megahertz and is it worth it to you? So you can easily come up with a value proposition to see if 100 megahertz is worth whatever price difference there currently is between the 2600K and the 2700K. But if the cost is much smaller between the two, I'd recommend going with the 2700K.